Hey you guys, welcome to Knowing Animals, the podcast where we talk to animal study scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. Well today we're doing a very special edition of Knowing Animals. Recently it was brought to my attention that some kind person has put some past episodes up on YouTube, but of course because it's audio only there's very little to look at. And so today I thought maybe we'd do something different and exciting and what we're actually doing is both recording this as a podcast and also filming it. So it's wonderfully exciting, uh, something that we've not done before and we owe a big debt of gratitude to Brian Rapsey who's filming for us and uh, the name uh, might seem like a bit of a coincidence but it's not (laughs) as much of a coincidence as you might think. But today on the program, we're going to be discussing Fiona Proben Rapsi's forthcoming article, Dingoes and Dog Whistling, A Cultural Politics of Race and Species in Australia, which will appear in the next edition of the Animal Studies Journal. Welcome to the podcast, Fiona. Thanks for inviting me, Siobhan. It's wonderful to have you here. So Fiona, can you start by telling us what inspired you to do this piece of work? Well, I've been looking into the cultural politics of eradication for a little while in relation to the dingo in particular, and it was this constant sort of um, reference to dingoes going extinct that I kept coming across in the literature. And it's it doesn't make any sense if you factor if you take out the idea of dingo purity. So the only thing that's actually going extinct is this quite old fashioned idea that dingoes are a pure specimen. Um, a pure species that has that has never corrupted itself with any genetic um, um, misprints of mixing with domestic dogs and feral dogs. So I just became really fascinated by this idea that dingoes are going extinct when it seems that they are abundant in other places if you just identify them differently. Okay, now we have quite a few international listeners. So can you start by explaining to listeners what a dingo is? So a dingo is a um, came to Australia between four and six thousand years ago, probably with the Macassan Sea Trade. That um, um, the Macassan Sea Traders engage with North Australia mostly, Aboriginal people as well, um, and they probably came across with sea traders on boats. Um, there's a theory that they either represented the walking larder theory, um, but also companion species as well. And once um, they came to the mainland, Aboriginal people also adopted them as semi-domesticated dogs that also became feral on the mainland and have been um, living on the mainland only only for that particular period of time. So they are, I guess, the comparison that's often made for uh, other species would be the wolf, but they're actually a distinct um, population. Right. Mm. So one of the important themes of your paper is the idea of race panic within species talk, and you use that expression a fair bit within the paper. Can you explain to listeners what you mean by that race panic within species talk? So that, uh, again, going back to this idea that dingoes are spoken about as a species that are going extinct through hybridising with domestic dogs, um, the fear that conservation biologists have had is that uh, the dingo population um, is being mixed genetically with domestic dogs and that therefore they are losing some sort of purity and some and, and their distinctive um, features. Um, but the thing is that scientists have been pretty much unable to establish a baseline for dingo purity, i.e. when do you start it? Do you, do you count 1788 as the point when dingoes were most pure? Do you therefore discount that entire history of the Macassan sea trade um, where dingoes would, would have been coming in not once but probably many times across those seas? Um so race, the race purity panic um, is a way for conservation biologists, I think, to articulate a fear that the species is being contaminated through colonisation, through mixing um, with domesticated dogs. And the way in which that rhetoric comes across is quite similar to the rhetoric of the, the melodrama of the dying race, which we also see in colonial history in Australia. 
So um, race panic is is based on this illusion of races being distinct, races being somehow pure, and that species gets mixed up in this as well because species and race have never actually been that distinct in the first place. As concepts, they come together with... Uh, with uh, Linnaeus talks about race and species simultaneously when he's um, writing Systema Natura in the in the Enlightenment. So we get these two concepts coming together, and they're they're entangled in the way in which they try and order the natural world, including uh, humans and animals. So not surprisingly, the rhetoric of being able to identify something as distinct and then losing distinction through mixing is is also there. So you suggest that there are some parallels in understanding talk about hybridity and dingoes and talk about kind of cultural purity and Aboriginal Australians. What can we learn from each example? What does one example tell us about the other? Well, I think one of the things that really um, that I find puzzling about the ways in which conservation biologists talk about hybridity as a loss and as contamination and as a menace like they they and swamping they quite literally use those terms this is this language comes from the fear of um authenticity of indigenous people being lost also through colonization biological assimilation so australia has this history of um, two seemingly contradictory ways of managing Aboriginal Aboriginal people and the threat of indigeneity. One is to segregate, i.e. to separate the races, but the other one in the 1930s becomes more and more about assimilating Aboriginal people. So these two contradictory uh, ways of colonising become expressed through anxiety about mixing. Do we completely assimilate them in order to make them disappear and become Indigenous ourselves? Or do we segregate entirely and keep them in this sort of authentic zone? Um, that that comes through in the literature on dingoes because it's a way of articulating some sort of loss that comes about through the, the way in which colonisation marks the landscape. Um, and what we can learn from that, I think, is that we can't we can't make bring these analogies and use the same rhetoric in a way that ignores the potential for this to um, cause cause the same sorts of problems with racism around questions of authenticity. As soon as you question the authenticity of um, a dingo around purity, around mixing, your your putting that language of miscegenation and fear of the racially mixed person back into the discourse, back, back into immobilising it again. And one of the things that I find really stunning is, is why, don't, why don't conservation biologists know that there is a danger of this becoming sticky again for other humans as well as for the dingoes? We know that this language is is the language, the language of eugenics. Mm. So why mobilise it? Why, you know... Why admit that, 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 that this other tension isn't always there at the same time? So I find it puzzling and I, I also found it, find it quite irresponsible. Mm. So you warn against making connections between hybridity and extinction. What would you like to see in its place? Um, I'm nervous about the word extinction because for me it's often used in a way that suggests that animals go extinct so like the dinosaurs went extinct as if they took themselves by them took themselves there by themselves uh, so there was no sort of agency on the part of humans i mean in the case of dinosaurs obviously there wasn't but in the case of every other species extinction that we're now experiencing humans are entangled with that story so I don't like the word extinction because I think it 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 um, leaves a question over responsibility, over agency, and over over um, what's causing it. The term that I prefer to use is eradication because I think when you when you think about what's going on, um, species are being eradicated with by by mechanisms that we have the knowledge to now understand to predict and potentially to deal with as well. 
Um, so yeah, I think I'm more interested in you in mobilising the term eradication as opposed to extinction. Mm. In terms of hybridity and extinction, um, the hybrid animal is not is not the is not extinct. They're, they're not an example of the extinction of a species. They're an example of uh, the evolution of the species uh, and the changing of the species and response of species to um, living in different conditions. In the case of dingoes, they're mixing with domestic dogs um, or what's called wild dogs. Is also a result of dingoes making certain choices about um, who they choose to mate with, who they choose to persist on the on the the boundaries of human habitation with. So that it, uh, hybridity, I think, is a word that really shouldn't be associated with extinction because it brings up this idea that the only true species is the pure one. Mm. Fascinating. Well, thank you, Fiona. That's really interesting and it will give our listeners a lot to think about. And, of course, many people may go and read your article, which will be out soon as a result. Now, I ask all guests to answer five quick questions at the end. So can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever read? Um, I can't. I can't actually think of the first one, but I can. The most memorable one, the one that moved me the most, would have been probably Elizabeth Costello, Jam Kutsi's work, because I did my PhD mostly on Jam Kutsi, and so I followed his his work after the the PhD as well, and that came out soon after my PhD had been finished. So it was Elizabeth Costello talking about the lampshades made out of human skin and drawing all those analogies and following her thinking that really moved me I think Mm. fascinating and can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever wrote yeah it would be um a piece about the live export scandal that broke in Australia in 2011 um it's called stunning Australia oh great so if you had to name one animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you who would it be um, there are so many. It's um, there are so many incredibly inspiring scholars in the field now. I, I find it really difficult to choose one, but the one that I'm really um, thinking with at the moment, especially in relation to the dingoes piece, is Claire Kim and her in her book Dangerous Crossings, which just came out in 2015, because she looks at this intersection between race and species, and because she looks at the ways in which those taxonomies work together that have a what she describes as a synergy. So her work and the ways in which she's really uh, encouraging uh, animal studies scholars to take intersectionality more seriously, I think that's you know that's high up on my um, my reading list and my influence at the mo- at this very moment, especially in regards to the dingoes. Hmm. Great. So what's the most important thing academics can do for animals? Mm, that's a good, really good question because I think we often struggle with our relevance, don't we? Um, I think we can make sure that animals get included in the agenda. I think in, in terms of the big social movements that we, that especially in the humanities and social sciences that we're interested in articulating, Animals have to be included. They have to be um, thought of. They have to be considered. They have to be um, made part of that conversation. And I think coming up with the that as an imperative is something that we really need. We really can do. We can really make it legitimate in that sense as well, and make mm. sure that it's it's constantly prioritised. Mm. So if you had the power to change one thing about the human-non-human-animal relationship, what would it be? I would would try and encourage what Val Plumwood talks about in terms of um, generating a greater sense of humility in relation to the, the, the rest of the animal world. So the moving away from that sense of human exceptionalism to think in less grandiose terms about ourselves and with a greater sense of generosity towards animal others. Mm. Thank you very much, Fiona. So what are you working on next? Well, the sheep industry. So dingoes, um, I'm working on a... uh, 
the project on dingoes continues, but the next part of it is looking at the ways in which the sheep industry is one of the major policy players when it comes to dingo conservation. So how this particular um, industry gets to have such a powerful voice in terms of both conservation of dingoes, but also the eradication of dingoes. Mm. Again, working with the hybridity equals extinction argument that they are also quite fond of. Mm. So how can people find out more about your work? They could go to my staff website and they can look at uh, the Human Animal Research Network at University of Sydney and through the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Wonderful. So thank you, listeners, for joining us for Knowing Animals, the podcast where we talk to animal study scholars about their work. Thank you, Fiona, for being our special guest and thank you, Brian, for filming. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals or on Facebook at knowing animals past and present. Also, don't forget to tell others about us and to review the podcast on iTunes. Reviews make it easier for others to find us. I am Siobhan Sullivan, and I do like knowing animals. See ya.